Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship and thank you so much for your patience with me this week. I hope you're ready to talk about polyandry. But before we get into some of the details of polyandry, let's review some things we've talked about before. Namely, for one, <laughs> marriage is hard to define. And one enduring characteristic of humans, their cultures, and their ways of life that I hope you've begun to observe throughout the semester are their flexibility and adaptability. If we can say anything about humans, more so than that, you know, humans are monogamous or humans are polygamous um, or humans are patriarchal. The thing that we can say is that humans are flexible. So polyandry is not as common a kinship structure as other forms of marriage. And like a lot of minority kinship structures have been really confusing to anthropologists who, as we know, anthropologists are humans and they have their biases about how kinship should work. So when you see this uncommon minority system, there's this strong temptation to explain and understand why this could have happened. All right, so let's look at polyandry in detail in terms of how anthropologists have thought about it and tried to explain it. Definitionally, polyandry is marriages consisting of one woman married to more than one man. These men are often related, usually brothers. So what makes polyandry happen? There are generally two schools of thought, and both of them are functionalist. That is, they're based on trying to figure out what polyandry does for people that other kinds of marriage can't do. Or what is it about these societies that another kind of marriage works better for them, even though it's very atypical? So the sociocultural functional explanations are generally focused on the fact that land tends to be really scarce in, a, in the places where we see a lot of polyandry. For example, the Himalayas. And so by having a set of brothers and property heirs have a single wife, you prevent conflict between brothers over who gets what property as an inheritance later, and you prevent the fragmentation of farming estates in places where you really don't want to have less land to farm because there isn't a lot to begin with. And in societies where men travel frequently and we see polyandry, one thing that polyandry can do for people is ensure that there's always one man around to do the man things. There is also a biological or evolutionary argument about polyandry, which is that when resources are scarce, no individual man could support a woman and her children. So teaming up with other men, preferably related men so that you're at least an uncle, if not a father, is the best way to have any surviving children and make sure your genes make it into the next generation. Under ordinary circumstances, the evolutionary concept is that it's best for men to have as much sex as possible, to have as many children as possible, but that only works if there's enough food for your children to eat. In a situation of scarcity, you've got to radically rethink that idea. But as we've discussed, functionalist explanations are unsatisfactory, and they're going to be unsatisfactory this time too. Spoiler alert. So in brief, here are Levine and Silk explaining why we can't really 
rely on functionalist explanations to talk about polyandry because basically we can't find a single shared factor amongst societies that are polyandrous. For example, it's common in the Himalayas, but if the environment of the Himalayas made polyandry necessary, then wouldn't all Himalayan societies be polyandrous? But they're not. So it, it just can't be functional. One thing that all of these functionalist explanations have in common is the idea that divorce is really bad in a polyandrous relationship. If you were to leave a polyandrous household, then you would be impoverishing yourself and endangering your children. So Levine and Silk, looking at this one particular society, the Nyimba, look at sources of stress in polyandrous relationships and household partition, basically the um, polygamous version of divorce, right? The household breaks up um, to see whether or not it really is as bad as the functionalist explanations would predict. So in particular, we should note that fraternal polyandry isn't very friendly to younger brothers, especially not among the Nyimba. Younger brothers might feel unequal in the household, for one. And there are usually awkward age differences between wives and younger husbands. Amongst the Nyimba, the marriages take place when the oldest brother is at an appropriate age for marrying, and he marries a woman who is similar in age to him, which means that the wife is then older than all of her other husbands. And depending on what you think about which age differences or what kinds of age differences are sexy, um, it could lead to bad sex. Younger brothers may father fewer children than older brothers because the shared wife has the same number of fertile years as any woman, but the older brothers will be having sex with her for longer than the younger brothers, and so will just have more opportunities to father children. That said, fraternal polyandry is still good for passing on your genes, because even if your wife's children are not your direct children, they're still your nieces and nephews. They're still related to you. They do still share your genes. But all of these struggles are compounded the more brothers you have. However, Levine and Silk wonder if it's easier to get along with co-husbands who are also your brothers than with unrelated co-husbands. So let's talk some more about the details of how polyandry and then household partition actually work among the Nyimba. The most common form of polyandry is bifraternal marriage, so two brothers and their wife. Trifraternal marriage is thought to be economically ideal because then you have brothers with all the economic specialties in Nyimba society and your household is totally taken care of. While polyandry generally involves one wife and multiple husbands, other wives can be added to the household sometimes if needed. So, for example, if the first wife is found to be infertile or later becomes infertile, you can bring in a second wife. Um, if younger brothers perhaps have a bad relationship with the first wife, you can try to make them happy by getting an extra wife just for them. Although brothers share wives, having their own children is important. This isn't true of all polyandrous societies, but it is true for the Nyimba. Women are often certain of paternity, and by this I don't mean that they like take paternity tests, 
but rather that they have their own very firm ideas based on their interaction with their husbands of who their children are fathered by. Partition can be a means to resolving marital difficulties basically by taking some people out of the marriage, by splitting up the shared household and its resources. But again, we still have this question, does it put men who leave polyandrous marriages at a material disadvantage, one, and does it improve their reproductive success, two? So here's what Levine and Silk found by reviewing their data. Household partition doesn't actually seem to leave men less well off on average. However, the men who instigate household partition are, again, on average, younger, disadvantaged in the birth order. So the more brothers you have, the worse it gets, the more angry <laughs> you get, and uh, not reproductively successful in their first marriages. Entering a new marriage does increase the reproductive success of these younger brothers. Note, however, that when they enter a new marriage, it's not necessarily monogamous. It might be another polyandrous marriage, like two of the younger brothers might split off and then share a wife and set up a new household. Finally, the degree of relatedness among brothers and co-husbands doesn't actually seem to matter very much for the stability of marriages. It's really about how many brothers there are. So what can we take away from this case study? The first thing is that maybe polyandry did originate because of land scarcity or resource scarcity. Maybe that first gave people the idea for polyandry, but that isn't what sustains polyandry. People don't keep doing it because of resource scarcity, because demonstrably, if you leave your polyandrous household, you don't lose out in terms of resources. This means that it's just cultural. It's just cultural. And in fact, even when men leave one polyandrous marriage, they often go on to form another. They don't conclude that the problem is with polyandry as a system. They conclude that the problem was just with that marriage. Men's age and position relative to their brothers slash co-husbands is the greatest indicator of dissatisfaction and household breakup. It's just hard to share, basically. In conclusion, here are a few things that Levine and Silk and me want you to think about. The first is that marriage in all societies is stressful because sharing is hard and living with other people is, well, you've lived with other people, you know how stressful it is. Some marriages in every society are going to fail. A lot of marriages will also not fail and having a lasting marriage is often perceived to be advantageous. And when it comes to choosing what your marriage looks like, a lot of that choice involves what you know, what's familiar to you, what you're comfortable with, and what that culture that you've been raised in teaches you is practical and sensible. And for the Nyimba, that's polyandry. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you next time.